Now, EK, on the home front, there are a number of things that I want to address. And as I said before, that I was not in a witch hunt. This administration and our team is not about a witch hunt. We wanted the proper audits to be done, and then once the proper audits are done by reputable organizations that we can present the findings. Interestingly enough, um, I, have, I, have, I saw an article somewhere to say that when I spoke of issues relating to corruption and money unaccounted for, that, that my is really, um, as I say, discredit by the former prime minister. That is an un, a very, very, um, I would say, unsavory statement by him. It is a statement that is, of course, not factual in any way. But I would say that even he has rights, and I am of the opinion that his rights should be respected. And whatever is done should be done properly. So here he is talking about past record, thinking that we may not have done the audit, but we have done it. And this afternoon, I'll read part of it because the people of the country must know that the money is unaccounted for. And so we have the 193-page audit. And with good advice, I'm now in a position, um, good advice, I'm now in a position to speak um, to aspects of the audit. I would also say that the audit will also be tabled because I think that it has to be seen. And in addition to that, the country has to be told where that $20 million has gone, $20 plus million, and the country deserves to have its money where it should be. This is too much money that is not properly accounted for. And therefore, I will read some of the findings from the audit today, the official audit. The other thing I'll touch on, E.K., because again, the former prime minister is misleading the country. In St. Peter's, where I'm from, we'll say he's lying. And he tried to put it out there with his fake pages and surrogates about the salary increase. I have actually with me the estimates from 21 2021-2022, of course, we were not there. Um, what they were looking at, what was planned in terms of the increase in remuneration for members of parliament. And I will also speak to a report that was done under the previous administration for remuneration of the federal parliament of St. Kitts and Nevis, and that report, Salaries Review Commission, 2018 to 2019, obviously, this administration was not leading the government. And this was done September 30th, 2019. That is when the final report was submitted. And so I will continue to release these, and I think this will also be, have to be made public because when you have someone going around misleading the people, the record must be set straight. E.K., the other matter that I want to say is that last night at the Prime Minister's lecture, we had Miss Psyche Southwell, a daughter of the soil, granddaughter of, of course, our, one of our national hero, um, um, yes, sir, um, Southwell, and she did an excellent job in her presentation. And what she speaks to is what we have been speaking about. She spoke about a smart hospital mm -hmm. and how she had been so integral in developing those things. So when people would have heard me said these things before, I think last night for those who listened understood that my utterances with respect to a smart hospital is real. It has been done. And the small size of our hospital compared to the larger mega hospitals where she has been doing her work makes it much easier. She has committed to help us here in St. Kitts and Nevis, which means that our small, smart hospital will, of course, be implemented um, sooner than we think in terms of the technology. And that would help significantly in the deliverance of quality good health care. In my trip to 
um, uh, Canada. I also visited a modern hospital to see how they integrate the technology, making it smart and so forth. I'll speak more to it in Parliament on, on Monday. I also had the opportunity to visit with the uh, lieutenant, um, well, the equivalent of the Governor General of, um, of Ontario. And I think that they, well, there is an article circulating with the pictures where we discuss um, our vision for sustainable island state. I am taking this climate change issue very, very seriously and think it's a Nevis will lead in terms of preparing um, what we consider to be a policy document that is practical, implementable, and something that can be modeled um, by others. And so we have done a significant amount of work um, to get it done. I want to thank the Honorable Dr. Joya Clark, who has been the lead on this one. And so we are coming we have come basically to the end of preparing that. That will be taken to the people in different fora to have their input to see. Uh, we'll bring the framework and they will determine, help us to determine the specifics. But again, the sustainable island state is to deal with the scourge of climate change um, that we are experiencing and to make sure that our country is positioned not only to survive but also to thrive. And I'm happy that last night's lecture really speaks to the possibility of establishing such a state, a sustainable island state. Um, Ike, I will delve a little bit into it at this point. And as I said, I want to say again that we were never involved in a witch hunt. So, so people accused us of staying long, accused me of staying long. But I think that even though person said that, I wanted to make sure that we follow the proper process of what is to be followed. But what was most surprising is to hear the one who led all of this um, trying to mislead the people and actually lie to the people, as we'll say um, here in local parlance, that there is no such information. So, Ike, let me read this. On taking office, let me say at the outset the last audit of the Development Bank was 2018. 2018. So the reason why audits were stopped is because this, what I'm about to read, is a type of structure to have money go, that money can go in all sorts of different ways and unaccounted for. So I will read. On taking office, the government solicited a forensic accounting report of the Development Bank of St. Kitts and Nevis. This was done by MNP LLP. I say it again. MNP LLP, one of the largest full service chartered professional accountancy and business advisory firms in Canada. They prepared the report dated January 18, 2023. MNP, LLP conducted their investigations between September and December 2022 and submitted the detailed report, which is 193 pages long. I have said that before. And I had not brought it before, and I think that's why they were probably thinking there was, not, there was no such report. However, they thought wrong. And they have asked that the information come forward. And since he has asked, I'm bringing it forward. So I wish to alert the public of some of the findings in that report. Now, there are many aspects to it, but the part I'm going to be dealing with is how they set up the mechanism to actually get the money out of the bank. I will not be calling any specific names today, but to let you know that they, all of this took place under the former CEO according to this report. Page 120 of the report, and it reads, In 2019, all wages, and in some cases advances, were paid by cash. The bank issued checks payable to a person's name. However, we understand he was not aware that any check was issued in his name. Rather, he would come to the bank 
to pick up grocery bags of cash. That's from the development bank. Grocery bags of cash every week for the duration of the period that he was involved in this particular program. The cash was accompanied by a sheet of paper with those who the money must go to. Those are grocery bags of cash coming out of the development bank to be distributed to whoever. Beginning on, that's page 120. Page 121 of the report reads, Beginning in October 2019, the bank issued checks payable to, and the person's name, which I would not call today, a development bank SKN employee. So in October 2019, the bank would write checks in employee's name or a particular employee of the development bank, St. Kitts Nevis. So here is an employee. The bank would issue a check in the name of that employee. And guess what happened? In some cases, checks were issued to other individuals. So that employee and others. However, the vast majority of these, approximately $20 million over time. So here is an employee. The bank is writing a check in that employee's name. Other checks were written. I am just talking about the $20 million because more money is unaccounted for. Approximately $20 million over time. And this is on page 121 of the report. A report prepared by MNPLLP, a chartered professional accountancy and business advisory firm in, in Canada. In, it's about the development bank. This is on page 121. I give that for those who might just have tuned in. However, the vast majority of these checks... Approximately $20 million, E.K., $20 million over time were issued to that person. And we have the name and the stub of the checks that went to National Bank. He indicated that he, she indicated that he, she took the checks to the National Bank and cashed the checks and then deliver the cash in large envelopes back to the bank, and that he never had any knowledge of the amount or use of the cash after that point. So he is an employee, E.K. The bank writes a check over this period of time, equaling up to $20 million dollars. That employee is instructed to go to National Bank. That employee goes in, meets specific people in National Bank who would know that em that employee is coming. Calls are made from on high to make sure that that connection is made. As he delivers the check, from what we see, some of the checks were written for up to $500,000, $650,000, $700,000. Then, as he goes, that check is cashed. No question is asked of him. Well, where you get all this money from? How come this check is written in your name? No bank ever writes a check in an employee's name or any other name and say, go and collect cash for the bank. That is a way to embezzle money. It's a way to embezzle money. And so they went, and he said he get this money in large envelopes. He, bring back, he brings back the raw cash back to the bank, and that he never had any knowledge of the amount or use of the cash after that point, totaling 20 million dollars in raw cash siphon from the account of the development bank that is in national bank an employee collecting sometimes a half a million dollars 
And once he delivers, uh, delivers that cash, he knows nothing else about that cash. E.K., the fact that you have to write a check to collect cash to the amount of $20 million, that alone is enough to be considered corrupt practice and embezzlement of funds. Let me go on. The cash would be brought back to the bank every week by the person. And that person, three employees will meet in the boardroom to count and package the cash in bundles to be distributed. Can you imagine that? Rock cash coming from National Bank to Development Bank. An employee carry a check brings back hundreds of thousands of dollars over time equaling over $20 million. That money is now had by a number of persons who go to a boardroom and that money is divided. Okay. Anybody can see that this type of practice is embezzlement of funds. Where is the $20 million? Where is the money? Nobody knows where the money is. And so, E.K., I wanted to put that. I have a, some other information to put out here. Let me tell you some others because a lot is in this report. The more you read this report, oh, my God, you can't believe that this actually took place. Let me read an next from page 125. And I will read it. And this one is connected directly to the peace program. You had what you call a management review board of the peace program. Mr. Lenworth Harris received from that. This has nothing to do with his salary. EC $147,000 from the management review board of this program. Initial engagement team, he received an additional $38,000 to a total of EC $185,000. Right here, we have the record to a one Mr. Lenworth Harris. You might know who that is, E.K. But this is what the report is saying. So that $185,000 had nothing at all to do with the increased salary to $30,000 per month. This is egregious. This has broken all the rules. And so when you hear people come in and rage about good accounting practice, what type of accounting would you call that? trying to fix numbers and hide numbers, but they cannot hide from a forensic accounting firm. You can't hide from them as much as you may try. They would find the money, 20 something million dollars, checks written in the name of an employee who went to National Bank to a specific person. Checks of up to $650,000, a half a million dollars, given in raw cash to be brought back to the development bank and in the boardroom, it is split up as spoils of a robbery, almost. It gives almost the aura of that. And then when you look at the ALP board, when you think people who are making $30,000 a month contributed $185,000. And this is just the scratch of the surface. This, of course, what we can place in Parliament at this time with good legal advice with, would be laid. E.K., there are people's name in this. There are all sorts of things in this. Because what I have gleaned is that persons put persons in compromising position, positions. And those people at times did not know that they were part of a grand scheme. Some people, they will have to determine a grand scheme
to siphon the money from the development bank's account at National Bank so that the money can end up in holes that sometimes they don't even know. EK. So EK, there's much more information, but because I am advised of what I may be able to say now, I will say, but I brought the issue of the $20 million from the report so that this nonsense about the former prime minister rubbishes the claim of $20 million. I really believe he thought that I did not have this because I spoke about it and never presented the official report now, the official name of the firm now, the details of when it was done. But it is time that people get to know some of what happened. If he speaks again, he's asking for the information, he'll get it. Because he knows what took place. That is the only thing I can say. He was the minister responsible. The forensic audit has revealed that at least 20 something million dollars missing. Because remember it said checks were written in other people's names. But today I focus mainly on the 20 plus million to this one employee who would go and collect large sums of cash to be taken back to development bank and that money was split up in the boardroom like thieves who just counting what they have stolen. E.K., so I would leave that there. I'm sure we'll get calls about that. But I want to go now to the issue of the salaries. One of the other things that he's out there saying is that we wanted to increase our salaries. But E.K., I bring the documentation. Facts I brought here. Because the more he talks, is the more facts he will get, and the people will decide who they are dealing with. That is why they decided not to pay the um, Social Security, the $120 million, they stopped paying that money in January 2022 to June to August 2022. Not one cent was paid from the Development Bank to Social Security. They, I would say, abandoned paying Social Security. And Social Security was feeling the brunt of that. And so this is the connection, E.K., this is the connection. So that money was probably an account somewhere. There's much more. But I will deal with the $20 million today and the salary matter. Because those are what I think need clarity. E.K., let's go to the Salaries Review Commission. St. Christopher and Nevis report. Renumeration for members of the federal parliament, St. Kitts and Nevis. I'm going to go through that again. Renumeration for members of the federal parliament. The report. Report. Date. Salary. Review Commission 2018 to 2019. Report tabled September 30th, 2019. That is on the previous administration. I am making the point here that the last salary review for remuneration for members of the Federal Parliament of St. Kitts and Nevis was done in 2019, 2018 to 2019. They um, tabled September 30th, 2019, saying clearly, EK with those dates, that this occurred under the previous administration. So any talk out there about this administration trying to increase the pay of ministers or myself, that I would use their term and rubbish that. E.K., that is total rubbish. We did not do any salary review. This was done and tabled September 30th, 2019. So that is the first point I want to make. But E.K., I'll go on to the second point. Because this was not just a report. We have to go to the estimates. The estimates, of course, when you have the debate, the budget debate, which we'll do in December coming. And this was... 2021-22 debate, 2022 debate, again under the previous administration and under the, and the former prime minister. Let's go through it. Estimated 2021, we remunerate members of parliament. Estimated 2021, 486, and it's in thousands, okay? It's in thousands. Let's move on now. But planned 2022. Planned 2022. E.K. Ministry Summary. Section 3. three ministry Summary. Provide legislative 
services for the Federation portfolio, responsibility, center, parliament, officer in charge, permanent secretary, goals slash global objectives to exercise the legislative functions of the government as directed by the Constitution of St. Kitts and Nevis. Financial summary. Under the, point pro under the program 00964, 00964, estimated 2021, 486. Now, we go on now, plan for 2022 in thousands. 895,000. So they've gone from 486,000 to 895, um, EK. What is that telling you, EK, to a total? You'll get the total there because you have support in um, the office of the opposition and so forth. So it's 1.9 million total it came up to, roughly. That big jump, EK, if you go to the report, the salary report, the salary commission is suggesting that you increase the salaries to this. So what they did in 21, 22, it was planned. So they were waiting until after the elections to implement this. So when we got there, we said, no, hold back on that. Let's look at minimum wage. Let's look at other things before we can push through that type of increase for parliamentarians. This EK report was done in 2019. They were acting on the recommendations when they look at the estimate they did the budget for 2021, 2022. He will come and say, I did not mention it in my budget. You did not mention a lot of things that are in the estimate, but the estimate said that that was planned, EK. That was planned. So when he's going around talking about we want to increase salary, he had the report, he planned it, and was waiting until August 6th, hoping that he would have won to kick that in, to pay so much a significant increase for the parliamentary. So the discussion is not even whether they deserve it or not. The discussion is, why is he misleading the country saying that I am responsible for it as the Minister of Finance, that we are responsible for it as a government? Why is he doing that when he knows we have the facts? Section 3, Ministry Summary, it is out there. And I'm going to have these, this information be put out so that people can see them for themselves. The Salary Review Committee, the report is here. The estimate, and he said... Plan, not estimated, it's a plan 2022. It is also here, but ready you know, to be delivered. But you know, Prime Minister, I think we need to put something into perspective about this whole conversation about salaries and introduce a couple of things into the conversation so that people could understand where this conversation arose from. You could recall, I think it was about last month or a couple of weeks ago, there was a town hall meeting of the the, 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 the the ministers of government. I don't mm. think you were there. You no, were, I wasn't. You was traveling. It was at the solid waste management. And there was a question and answer segment after the presentation by the ministers. And a question was put forward about the integrity in public life with respect to corruption. And the person asked the question in this way of increasing the ministers and parliamentarians and certain key positions in the government salaries so that it could... Be a deterrent. Be a buffer to a uh, deterrent, so to yes. speak, um, to corruption. So the person asked that question. Right. The Deputy Prime Minister, Dr. Hanley, responded to the question and then passed it on from a legal standpoint to the Attorney General. And the Attorney General went deep into the conversation and spoke to that report and what was in the estimates going forward. Yes. And some people heard that conversation and took it to mean that your administration is going to increase salaries. So that's where this whole thing started. I got from, you. Know? Yes, I wasn't I wasn't that. You yes, wasn't you, yes, you thank you, you for you, that. You were overseas. I was overseas at the time. I, I, I can't yes. understand for the life of me yes. why people yes. would take that conversation yes. and spin it around. I guess it's for political yeah, it's purposes. It's for political purposes. But what is sad though, people would say that. But instead of you know those who actually did this, such as the former prime minister, instead of them giving clarity they tried to use it also for political advancement. Right. And that is why I brought it here today, to let the people know clearly that he is the one who 
forwarded this. And this was planned to be put in place in August of 2022, after they would have hoped to have won the elections. That is clear here. So I want those, that second thing. So I dealt with the $20 million, and I dealt with who is responsible for bringing forward the increase in salary. Ike, I want to touch on a third one, because another nonsense that is going around is how much advisors and these people are being paid. Mm -hmm. I see all kind of numbers. Of course, they are saying that this may not be right. But every government has um, advisors. They had them too. And what we used to happen in the past is that you had advisors. And a lot of them used to be non kitishans because we didn't have the expertise in certain areas. Thank God now we have the expertise. If we don't have it here, we have it overseas. And I have taken the decision to give our people the, f the, the first opportunity, whether they're here or whether they're overseas. Mm. When these advisors used to be other people who are not kitishans, you never used to hear any talk. And I'm going to delve into some of it right now because I want to show that irrespective, they are lying about the numbers, but irrespective of that, I want to say to them that even the numbers that they are lying about, that those do not even come up to half to what one consultancy group under that previous government used to get. Not even a quarter. Mm. So I will go through it. And I'm speaking to payments to, uh, of course, the project management of the Bastia High School. And I have the, the, the actual um, paper here in front of me. Minute paper, 7th October 2022, Honorable Jeffrey Hanley, Minister of Education. And of course, what I speak here is what the AG has advised me that I can speak to. Please see, uh, please see schedule of funds paid to the consulting group via the Ministry of Education relating to project management fees for the Bastia High School. E.K., have you seen a Bastia High School? Mm. Is there a new Bastia High School built? Well, the old one is still there. Well, well, where is the new one? So here we are paying for the management of a new school and nobody's seen on the school. So what were you managing? That is why we said you had to be managing dirt. But that is not the worst part of it. It's the amount paid. And I will go through the amount. To date, and this was written to the minister October 27th, October 2022. To date, a total of $14,427,000 million, $920, was processed, with the last payment being 17 June 2022. Well, you know, when we got in there, we got in there and we decided that we're not going to continue with the payment unless something clearly is done. There were no payments processed via the Ministry of Education for the insurance coverage from the national insurance. So let's go through it, EK. This is a um, consultancy fees. Even with the fake thing they're sending around, out of all the money that come up for ambassadors' consultancy, I'm not even talking about their, that what they had as advisors or who they had as advisors and who they had as consultants. I'm just dealing with one consultancy so people can see that this amount is more than five times, or more, maybe about five times more than all of who they are claiming receiving that amount. This is an egregious act. This amount of money spent on a school and no school built. It's hard not to get upset when you read these things. But I'll control my temper. There were no payments processed by us. So let's go. February 2021. Payment. $3,532,143.60. No school built. Project management service, services no school built, and you get $3 million. For what? March 2021, $1,806,760. April 2021, same amount, $1.08 million. May, same amount, $1.08 million. June, this is one, you know. 
This is one. This is not talking about one person getting $10,000. This is one entity getting over a million dollars for no work done that we see. You see a school to manage? June 2021, $1.086 million. July 2021, $1.086 million. August 2021, $1.086 million. EK. Then in September 2021, 437,529. And they got that amount in September, October, November, December, January, February, March, April, May, June. You see a school to manage? Hmm. A total of fourteen million. Four hundred and twenty-seven thousand dollars, four hundred and twenty-seven thousand nine hundred and ninety-nine dollars and forty cents. Okay, look at that. For all the advisors they're sending around these fake things with, they don't add them up. They had I think twenty something names. Even if you take them at what they said, that's two hundred and something thousand dollars a month. This month for one person is twice all those. 20-something um, people that are putting out there. Twice? Five times? Five times as much. <laughs> if, if I get one of that month, you, you ain't going to hear from me again. You ain't going to hear from me again. You see a school? Wow. Ike, we have the facts. But we were prudent in bringing out the facts because we were mindful that we had to be prudent. And so when we bring the facts, we bring real facts. Early August 2022, you informed the Office of the Director of Public Works Department via telephone that no further activity should take place in relation to the construction of the new bus. There was no activity. What activity was taking place? None. There was none. No school. There's no insurance policy in place for the project. I mean, there's an insurance policy in, in place, but no clear decision taken. So let me correct that. There was one in place, but nothing done, EK. Where's the school? $14 million. And you're coming, come talk about this person get $10,000, that person get ten, and this is one person. I haven't dealt into what Michael Powell got. I haven't dealt into what, and I don't want to go into all these names because I have a list of names as well. I don't really want to go back. So I'm asking myself, why is the former prime minister exposing himself like this? I am thinking that he wants to expose everybody else. He wants to throw all of them under the bus because if I start to call names, EK, those people are implicated. And I don't want to, I've refused to go down that until something official might be done. But the thing is, this occurred under his leadership. He knew that this was taking place. He had to have known he's the Ministry of Finance, he's the Prime Minister. If I know how he didn't, how, how, how can he say that he did not know? He must know. $14 million for Bastia High School that he built. Official document. Estimates 2021 to 2022 shows that they had planned for increase in salary of their pay from the Prime Minister down to every minister from, um, planned from um, 2022 from August 2022, after the elections. A remuneration of members of federal parliament of St. Kitts and Nevis, the report done and tabled in September of 2019. And of course, I brought here today to show the mechanism, the scheme, the structure of how they embezzle $20 million out of the accounts of development bank that are at the National Bank. And so, E.K., I wanted to share these three things with the people. And we are going to table the report in Parliament. He asked for it. And I'm going to table the salary review report. It was an official report. Those who did it did an excellent job. It's separate and apart to what he's saying. I want to separate the people who worked from what he's out there um, 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 pushing. And the one from the Bastyr High School I think that that also needs to be tabled. We're going to write those into the records. That is what he's asking for. I told him we are not about a witch hunt. We are about um, doing things properly and procedurally. And to be out there as if we are misleading the people. This says a lot about him. 
You know we have the facts. You know we have the truth, yet you are out there speaking as if this does not exist, and he knows. But I think what he wants is to expose the others who were involved, and to show that he alone was not corrupt, and to pull down all of them with him. That is what he's actually planning from my perspective with all of this. I would say that because I cannot understand why he would do something like that. Know that we have the facts. Man, keep quiet and move on, huh? But you're going to be out there baiting and saying things that as if I am lying to the people and I don't have the information. But I say again, this was not a witch hunt. This was about finding the truth, fact finding, and let wherever the truth settles, let it settle. And whatever are the consequences of the truth, let that be the consequence. But I've always said that he has rights and his rights must be respected. However, I think he should choose wisdom over these acts of going out there and shows and acting as if the information is not had. It is right here. And we are going to table it and read it into the record. Because this is the last audit done for the Development Bank since 2018. And the reason why no audits were being done is because this type of scheme will be, was being hatched and to make sure that people do not get access um, um, to what was being done. However, the people chose to change the administration. A forensic analysis has been done by a reputable firm with no skin in the game and has presented its findings. And so EKI have shared these findings with our people today. So before we get to the phone line, three critical things presented today. One, how they set the scheme up to siphon $20 million. Two, that the salary review was actually done by them and planned for increase in August of 2022 after the elections. And then I brought the third one, which was the Bastia High School, to show how one consultant actually got $14 million dollars more money than all these advisors they're talking about getting per month. One consultant who is not from St. Kitts and Nevis got at least $400,000 up to a million dollars, and in one case, three point something million dollars for a school that no one can see. E.K., it's an invisible school. Hmm. It's like the emperor with no clothes. Who is brave enough to tell the emperor you have on no clothes. Mm. And I'm saying, this is a case of that. There is no Bastia High School built. So they were actually managing dirt at the site that they had said the Bastia High School would be structured on. So Ikea will leave it there, there and give our people an opportunity to interact. All right, so it's 2.35. The telephone lines are now open. The Prime Minister has uh, indicated. So those of you who may wish to ask a question of the Prime Minister, you may do so now. The lines are 662-1065-465-647-465-0546. Prime Minister, while we await some telephone calls, because yes. I guess you left the people in shock and awe, otherwise yes. it's full of it, don't be rigging a long time. <laughs> um, on, on another note, though, and, and I do understand that we have to dispel of you know rumors and political gimmickry that people are trying to put out there, but and I, I, I am for the people, and, yes. and that's why I champion my cause. Right. And you as the prime minister, your responsibility is to chart the course and the ebb and the flow of the country on many fronts. And from what I've been hearing, you know, through the grapevine on the road, speaking with lots of people, is that the, the economy is a little bit tight. Mm -hmm. And so people are asking, when can we see um, some things happening to more or less ease the pressure and ease the burden from the people and see the, the economy being turned around and, you know, going back to where it was? Right. Thank you very much, E.K. That's a very good question. First of all, I would say that since we opened up the country, thousands of jobs have been provided. Mm -hmm. I want to set that premise. Remember, when you didn't have a robust tourism industry, a lot of people went back to work in an opened tourism industry. Remember when you had other aspects of the industry, such as 
those who work in, in hotels and so forth, apart from taxi drivers, they were able to go back to work in full. So we know already we created thousands of jobs. These, most of these persons did not have any employment previously. They were not working, and so they were not bringing in an income. I would like to ask and reflect on them and ask them how they were surviving, because a lot of them were going through a lot of difficulties. How do I know? I had a foundation, used to deliver food to people. Mm -hmm. I used to deliver food to people. And I know what the need was. I had people who were solidly middle-class people who did not have enough food, who I had to deliver food for. Or they would call us, they would say to me, that's through the Kia Foundation. So that is why we know thousands of jobs. Just in the tourism industry alone, there was a significant increase in that. The fact that you had the country open up and more activities, small businesses that were closed down, many of them were able to open back up. Not only that, we have provided to the, Nash, to the Development Bank thousands, over 300 small business loans to get small businesses back on track. EK. Those who own, for example, preschools, their preschools were closed. The preschools opened back up, and they are having challenges, but now they can see the way of now starting to earn again. People who, didn't, who used to cut grass and couldn't get a yard to cut, they are now seeing that they can get a yard to cut because the persons have gone back to work and can now bring in somebody to cut their yard. In the STEP program alone, because we know that factories had been closed, do you know how much people we employed who were not working at all, EK? Over, we took the decision to bring back over 1,000 people because we know that the factories closed. Remember how many factories closed under the previous administration? And those people needed to be paid a salary or something, and we brought on a thousand. That is why we know thousands of people went back to work. But, so but, at least, but, I'm going to get to it, so mm -hmm. at least we can say that the economy is opening back up. Mm -hmm. But the point remains, has it reached back to where it was? No. You had two years of the world shutting down, of the country shutting down. The whole world presently is going back through an economic recovery. There is not one country on this earth that is not going through some difficulty whether it be opening back up businesses, whether it be supply chain issues, especially when you started with the war in, um, in, 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 Ukraine. in Ukraine, for example. And on top of that, you had the inflation from North America and the big countries and the imported inflation that we suffered. These are things that we suffered. And on top of that, the increase in gas prices. So there are multiple external shocks that hit us here in St. Kitts and Nevis. And to be honest, we are not back where we were. But we were able to keep a lot of things afloat. We were able to subsidize electricity significantly. We are spending now, EK, a quarter billion dollars to 25 to 30 percent of the economy and social net on the social net alone. For example, children going back to school, helping the mothers at the preschool level, at the primary school level. All those seamstresses and so who never was sewing, they started to sew again. School opened back up, bus drivers back on the road again. So what we are saying, even though we are not back there, I can guarantee you, Ike, that we are better off than we were when we were under the scourge of the pandemic. And these are the four major shocks that hit us, that really impeded us, but we are able to be further ahead than other countries in the region in terms of our overall outlook. For example, you heard in Antigua, somebody mentioned something that we are doing for our children that they are looking at and admiring. So, Ike, I would say that is the premise, that we are doing much better than we were under the pandemic. To the, the first quarter, we actually saw surpluses. Surpluses. We did not re-increase the corporate tax neither incorporated or non-incorporated. We left one at 25% uh, and at 2% respectively. And still, June 2023 20, recorded the highest ever collection in the history of St. Kitts and Nevis of a tax collection month, ever, which tells us there had to be economic activity that was taking place. This has nothing to do with CBI at all. Because as I've said, we had become too dependent on CBI 
and we needed to start to transition away from being so dependent on CBI and look to broaden the, widen, the wider economy so that we can have an economy that is not dependent on any single sector, but is, of course, diversified. So I can say that those are facts. However, is there inflation and prices going up and, and some goods? Yes, I admit that. Has this posed difficulties to our people? Yes. And that is why we decided we, can cut, we, we will increase, in many instances, the support that we give and also to make available other services that were not there before, such as the service to help mothers to send their children back to school, such as increasing the amount that people get when they send a child to preschool, such as making the college free, such as creating a fund that if a child gets sick, they can get free medical care and attention such as subsidizing electricity up to a hundred and something million dollars per year so that people can have electricity, people can have water, and the water services we'll talk again, because we just invested $30 million in our water sector to deliver water 24-7, uh, at least allow people to have a supply of water so that they can have it at least once daily. But we know we can get much more than that. The drilling in care on the diesel plants and so forth, $30 million. So it comes back to Ike. Do we need more activity? And your point, Ike, yes. So there are people who are saying they want to see more activity. So irrespective of what's happening around the world, what is our plan? To make sure that people continue to do better. So I know more people are doing better than before. That just from the numbers, based on how many people did not have jobs and we were able to see them go back to work, whether it's hotel industry or even uh, part-time jobs that they never had before. So what we are doing presently now, we are starting to roll out our capital projects within the construction sector. So we're going to have three things happening now. Tourism is getting ready to restart, and I want to congratulate the Honorable Marsha Henderson. She and I flew back from the United States yesterday. She was on a particular mission, and I guess she will speak to it. I want people to know that Carnival had taken a decision not to come to sink it's in great numbers because of what happened during the pandemic and because, of course, they, we needed. So we needed to work with Carnival, communicate with Carnival, negotiate with Carnival. And I want to thank her for the work that has been done. And we can expect an increase in, in, in Carnival this year. That's the cruise line mm -hmm. to sink it's and Nevis. They're going to send some larger ships, and we expect the largest ship in the world to come to St. Kitts as well. Okay. That is going to, because of the airlift that we have um, embarked upon, hotels are now reporting that they will have 7 to 10% increase in occupancy. Already I see the hotels are sending out the advertisement for workers getting ready for the tourist season. The tourist season behind the CBI is the largest sector. That sector is going to generate thousands of jobs. And you know that once the tourist season starts. So there's a lot of hope in the tourist season, and we expect to rebound more. Remember, again, the reason why we rebounded slower is because the country was kept locked down for too long. If the country had been opened up since April, May, we would have been in a better stead. That is why when we got in, the first decision made was on the 7th of August was to open up the country. As soon as the sworn me in as Prime Minister, the Saturday, by the Sunday, I am meeting with the task force who dealt with the COVID situation, asked them to present me the scientific data. I had the data analyzed already. I looked at it. And I know that we were in a position to open up. I said, present me the data. Can we open up? And the CMO said, yes. Not only that the data showed we could have opened up earlier. Had we opened up earlier, instead of having the slowest recovery in our tourism product, that is what is hurting us still. There's a drag. We should have recovered almost fully last year. But because we opened up so late, the people, the ships and so forth, and people went different places. People who were accustomed to come to St. Kitts, they had to go to different places because St. Kitts was still with these unnecessary restrictions by that time. And that was done under the former prime minister, locked down the country, stifled the economy. We are feeling some of the scourge of that. Look at the data, and you see that our trajectory for recovery, especially in the tourist sec tourism sector, is slower than the rest of the Eastern Caribbean. That's one. So tourism is going to bounce back significantly, and we're going to see a lot of jobs being created. That's one. The second thing, our capital projects. I want to say to the people, we are going to, on Monday, groundbreaking for our housing revolution. Monday. I wanted to do it today, 
but the Minister for Housing is away on national duty, uh, make, doing a, a, a major agreement with a major university mm -hmm. that's going to help us to develop our sustainable island state. He's away on national duty. And so I did not want to do the groundbreaking without him. So we are going to do the groundbreaking for our housing revolution on Monday. Okay. Right. So that's one. Secondly, the capital project, such as the St. Peter's project, the bidding has done. So we're going to have that contract this year. That's going to roll out. The Connor Reef Playfield, the MRI building, the roads in the community that we are concentrating on, those dirt roads in the community, we are going to pave um, some of those um, as well. In addition to that, you will have the private sector um, being stimulated to create more construction jobs. Because we know once tourism hit, we're going to absorb those persons in tourism. And once we start the construction sector again, you're going to have your, 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 brick, your masons, your electrician, your plumbers, and so forth, who will be um, going back out there. And with the capital projects coming on, we will also see. Also, I was to mention, see, there's a lot, number of capital projects. We still have about almost $200 million in capital projects to be spent this year. So this last quarter, when we have finally put all these things together, we will have tourism hitting, the, the construction sector hitting, and we'll also have the, the area of you know, financial services and so forth hitting. So we're in for an excellent um, last quarter. So EK people, uh, right, so we are telling them we have prepared for the tourism, expect an increase in tourism compared to last year, more activity, more jobs, more opportunities. They can expect more uh, construction activity as we now going to do our groundbreaking for our housing projects and the other major um, capital projects to, to be rolled out, and we're going to stimulate also the private sector. While we are doing that, we are pursuing other capital projects, which we have spoken about, and some of them are reaching their final decision to move forward. So, Ike, I would say, in the next, once we hit that period, between that period up to December, it will be an a, a, a increased activity in construction, in tourism, in financial services. So, we are going to see more activity. However, the imported inflation is still a problem, because we have no control over it. If you sell a carnation milk in the U.S. for a certain amount, no matter how much taxes and so we, we, we reduce, the milk that is coming from the U.S. is, or from North America rather, is increased in price. That is what you call imported inflation. There are other alternatives. I'm encouraging people to look at other inter alternatives, such as the bunny milk and so forth, to see if the CARICOM alternative will be easier on your pocket, because mm -hmm. CARICOM has set out to make sure that we make available alternatives to these higher price um, products so that people in the CARICOM region can have um, better priced products. However, people have their tastes, and based on people's tastes, they might not want to switch from one brand to the other. Mm -hmm. But the brand that is coming from there, we have to admit that it is increased, not because of here, but increased from there. Okay. And therefore, that is what we call imported inflation and high cost of living. All right. Um, one more thing before we, we, we take yeah. that um, a call here. Yeah. The minimum wage increase. Um, yes. I would have heard the Honorable Sam Conda mention that the report is already completed, um, ready for um, yes. the next phase. So right. where are we on that? Good. So the report, as you know, last year we decided to hold back on the increase in pay. I mean, we can take the increase in pay because it, it was really, it was in the estimates and it mm -hmm. passed through the parliament and so forth, so it's, it's legal. But we said, let's look at the minimum wage first and see what is there. The report has been completed. Now, the Honorable Sam Kanda, who is leading that, he is now going to take that report to the people, have discussions with the people in different fora, so that, that public relations and communication is critically important, so people understand what is in the report, why it's in the report, to have the experts speak to it. Because I think last week, Friday, I think someone from from Social Security was on with him talking about the minimum wage and so forth. So they're going to do that. And then um, the communication with the people, and then we are um, going to bring that forward. I had the conversation with the Honorable Marsha Henderson. Remember, no plan was in place to increase the people's salary. None. We had to start from scratch. And this is a process, of course. Mm -hmm. Had there been something in that had started, it would have helped and be easier, but that was never. The only increase in salary that we saw in the estimate was the increase in salary for ministers 
and parliamentarians, we did not meet an increase for the minimum wage. And therefore, we started it early, and it takes a process, and we have we brought everybody to the table, and that process is almost to the um, to finality. I can't. I want that to be done as quickly as possible, and we have done it as quickly as possible. But it is not quick enough for the person who really needs it, right. and I understand how that person feels. I really truly understand, but it, it, it just carries a particular process. Otherwise. When you think you're doing something good, it can turn out and hurt all of us even more if it is not properly carried out. So we can see sometimes when you're in governance um, and you're looking at it from, look, I, I can see the, the consequence of not doing this properly and, and, and seek to act to protect the people. But a man who is hurting, he can understand that. Mm -hmm. And I understand his position. Right. But right now, I need an extra dollar because I need to buy an extra bread. But the government saying they got to wait for the process. I understand what he's going through. And I would never try to be defensive to what he's going through. But at the same time, I have to think, if I push through a process that is not properly done, he, may not get, he can't get the extra bread now. But if this go foul and affect the economy in different ways, if he's buying one bread now, maybe next year, even with the attempt of an increase that is not properly done, he might be able to only be able to buy a half a bread because the economy across the board is much more affected right. that affects him could be an more. internal influence it could um, be a, yes there you go exactly and we can create an internal injury that can put people in worse positions than they are uh, um, presently and so i would never ever defend if somebody said boy i have it a little rougher but from our perspective we have to say what is the best we can do for our people? We want to give people an increase. It has to go through a process, and we dealt with the process as quickly as possible so that we can get there So because there was nothing on the books, and there had not been a minimum wage increase for a decade. And that is one of the criticisms that we are getting. How is it the country brought in wealth, just a surplus after surplus, and the people didn't get an increase in their minimum wage? The best way to empower a person is to in, you know, to seek to affect their wage or their wages. Why? Because they have, they would have increased social security contributions. So at the end, uh, so when they retire, they would see a larger income from social security. If you don't do that, you that is why labor movements fight for increased wages, a minimum wage. Because if you don't do that, you run the risk of people, too many people, or people in general retiring in poverty because your social security is calculated based on how much you contribute and how much you contribute is determined by how much you earn during the time that you are working. Right. And so that is why, you can. so I said to all people that I know some people are having it uh, challenging and we are doing our best expeditiously to, to, to bring some relief. All right. Let's take our first call. <laughs> Caller, thank you so much for waiting. Go right ahead. Yeah, good afternoon. Prime Minister, good afternoon. Um, I just want to congratulate you. You are doing a wonderful job. I appreciate it. I won't lie to tell you, I appreciate it. You're doing a good job. Keep it up. We have a long way to go, but don't let nobody distract you. Just stay focused because the same Timothy Harris tell us when he was in government, hurry dog, eat, rock on. So please, you, Stay focused. We put you there to do a job, and we are seeing somewhere. We are heading somewhere. So continue to keep up the good job. And let me tell you something. I've been behind you a hundred percent. And Ek, yes, you sir. see the other day. The other day, I tell you, you know, Ek, <laughs> somebody got to go to jail for them kind of thing going on. Yeah, you know, nobody the got yet. So you still owe me a hundred dollars. We were, but Ek, bet on you know, because Prime Minister, you know, that Prime Minister, we were free, you know. Because I'm telling you, Ike, with all them bad things we hear keep going on and keep going on, at the end of the day, if PM can't come week after week, month after month, to tell us and tell us and tell us, and nobody are held accountable, you know. PM, I will get upset with you and that. Somebody yes. have to held accountable. And I know, Prime Minister, I'm telling you, as I leave, you have to clean up. House and house take a long time before you start to work, but thank God you clean out a spot and you're working according me. Timothy and his team them leave a dirty mess behind, and you got to come and clean it. 
But what happened, what they're using on us is to distract us and make us focus somewhere else while you're cleaning house and make good pathways for the people of Sinkit to have a better life. They come in with a stupidness. PM, stay focused. I love you. The people of St. Peter's number eight love you, and we will always love you. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you very uh, much, caller. I want to thank you for, of course, your endorsement and, and, and your support. Really appreciate it. All right. Caller, you're up. Go ahead. Good afternoon, Mr. Good afternoon. And Go straight ahead with your question, please. Yes, Carl Brown here. Honorable Prime Minister, question. Carl, yes. Uh, does Social Security, as we um, involve in a lot of, um, like CARICOM, OECS, OAS, does Social Security have any investment overseas in a number of Caribbean countries? That's one question. And number, number two question, um, you talk about construction will be booming in the last quarter of the sea and the tourism and that stuff. What about the industrial side? The government have any plans of allocating one or two more um, companies or factories at the industrial side to create large employment there? And the last question, we have the Chinese, them here, the Indians, right? We now have Russians, and they're coming from their country, which they have lots of factories, lots of um, things that they make and import. How come none of them are bringing our factory here to employ over 500 or even 5,000 persons that they come here and they do mega jobs? And, and, and do like supermarkets and oils and they even, they even doing um, banisters and those sort of things. How come they, those people, you can't get those people? I ask every government the same question, you know. You're not the first government. How come they can't bring a factory here? Because they have so many factories, make so much things. And, and distribute these things, sell all over the world, make billions of dollars. How come they can't bring a factory here? So we could get a even a 500 or 5,000 people employed here and have some of those products um, sell overseas that we bring in foreign income. Those are my questions. All right. All right. Thank you yeah. so much for your questions, You want me to answer? He asks a lot. A lot. Yeah. Well, um, let's take this next call and okay. then we'll allow you to answer. Okay, people. no problem. Call your one. Go ahead. Hi, good afternoon. I'm just calling to ask if there is anything in place for the Monkey Hill Road. That road is really horrible. So I'm just calling to ask if there is anything put in place for this road to be, you know, fixed. That's my question to you. Very much. Very good okay. question. So EK can start from the last question. I want to say to the caller that there's a massive project that will take place on the St. Peter's Road and west on the F.T. Williams. Not, well, coming down, you'll be left, well, to the east, rather. Let me put it that way. Um, because there's a spot there that needs to be done in between by the Gillard's area. There's a spot that has not been done. The tendering has been completed. It is now going before the procurement board this week, and someone will be issued the contract. So I will say that significant work will be done. The caller is correct. The St. Peter's Road is bad. I spoke to the Minister of Public Works. He has said that he would let them go there and start some of the patching even before the major road work would have been started. So this, to the St. Peter's people, you'll get retaining walls. You will get sidewalks. You will get um, a, a, a paved road that is, you know, that is of good quality, that is properly marked out and so forth, a significant project all the way from up in, up in the Hodges area come all the way down east of the F.T. Williams Highway. That has been budgeted for E.K. And White House too? Well, we're going to put, um, we're going to do some roads in the yeah, villages. So I'm in, just in, teasing. I already saw the work going on. No, yes. Oh, okay, yes. No, seriously, we are doing some of the village roads and we have identified um, a major White House road to be done. Mm. So we are going to do that infrastructure. So that call out call about the St. Peter's Road, you are right. The road is bad. It needs to get done. It was not included in the plan uh, when the island main road was resurfaced or refurbished, and then this one. So now we have come up with the plan to do it. The engineering, all of that has been done, and it's before the procurement board. 
and we, we will start work before um, the end of the year. But in the meantime, the Minister of Public Works, he and I spoke, and we're going to patch. We were saying that we would start before, so once all the machinery move up to St. Peter's, it just takes care of everything. But we might need to do some patching before we get to the major road work. So I want to thank the caller. While I'm that, EK, I want to say to the St. Peter's bus drivers and to Smooth, who is the president, I went and we identified a piece of land that can possibly be used mm -hmm. for a bus stop. We are in con conversation with the owners for the land. If the owners for the land lease us or sell us that land, we are going to start construction. Well, the process to construct almost immediately. The St. Peter's people also deserve, or those who use that bus station, deserve a good um, bus station as well, or a place where they can wait for the bus, and the bus drivers deserve a place where there can be a bathroom, a place to relax, if they need to relax between trips and so forth. So that we are pursuing in earnest, and as soon as that is completed, we will inform them as to the direction with respect to that. E.K., um, to touch on what Carl said about Social Security, Social Security has investments. As a matter of fact, the IMF report said that the Social Security should invest a little bit more overseas into very stable um, instruments that will serve them over a long period of time. So, yes, they do. I am talking about Social Security lending $120 million to the Development Bank, and the Development Bank between June 2022 and August 2022 refused to pay one cent. That is totally unacceptable. And so we had to act to stabilize the bank. And I've said to the bank, you have to pay back Social Security. That is the people's money. All right, um, that's one. He also spoke about the industrial site. Well, as you know, under the former administration, a number of factories closed down. And we are seeking now to reestablish what can be reestablished. So we're in conversations to have to see what we can do to get factories there. We have now in conversations with Jaro. Jaro has expanded its activities. We want to support its activity because it's providing jobs, even night jobs. We also want to the Harrow at Sandy Point. We, are, we also want to encourage them and to support them to increase their activities um, there as well to produce jobs. But we are in conversations really to see if we can get factories coming back to St. Kitts and Nevis. It's a very competitive world, especially because people are looking for the cheapest areas to go to. But we think we can create a product that can have persons, um, persons come here um, um, to work. I, I think that those are the ones that he spoke about. Right. Um, anything else that I might have forgotten or not m wouldn't have made a, a note of, you can let me know and right. I will quickly answer. Um, so I have a question coming in on the, the Facebook platform, and this is to do with the increase in bus fares. Yes. Um, I had a conversation recently with a, a, a number of the, the, the bus association mm. presidents, and they are very much concerned about um, increase in bus fares and what the conversation looks like with regard to that and if you right. So I met with the bus association mm -hmm. myself and the Honorable Congress Maynard and they are discussing the situation with bus fares and so forth and a number of other things that can be done to make sure that whatever the bus fare is we want that to be fair to our people especially post-COVID when people are having challenges, mm -hmm. how can we work together to make sure that the bus fare is at, is, 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 is either remains where it is with other things to offset it or whatever the negotiations reveal mm -hmm. is fear unto the people and fear unto the bus drivers as well. So I just want to say that the negotiations um, have started and mm -hmm. they are ongoing. Right. So well, let me put it that way. All right. Let's take this next call. Call Iran. Turn on your radio, please. Go ahead. Good afternoon, E.K. Good afternoon, Mr. Prime Minister. Good afternoon. My name is Berlin Warner, constituency number three, polling division six. I'm calling in reference to, a, to the pension plan for auxiliary workers. I, I, I really, I really and truly don't want to hear that it is in the works. I need a, a deadline, a time period. This is long overdue. Long, long, long overdue. And another thing, I realize that the, 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 the um, government, the administration, does have meetings with all kind of people. You all don't feel like the auxiliary workers' voice needs to be heard. I think we have things that we need to say, but nobody calls us to a meeting to say, to say well, 
how we all feel, how nothing. It's like everybody just taking us for granted. This can be fair to us. I don't, I don't want to know disrespect to you, Mr. Prime Minister, but I don't want to hear that it is in the pipeline. So, so let me, let me now. answer your question, caller. I want to say that I have not forgotten the auxiliary workers at all. You know that in 2021, under the former administration, they downgraded your gratuity payment as an auxiliary worker. You're aware of that, correct? Yes. Yes, yes, caller? Yes, I am aware of that. And you are aware also that one of the major decisions we made was to upgrade all of them, even persons who have passed away, to, give, to pass on that money to their family members, the upgraded um, gratuity payment to auxiliary workers to equal those of regular civil servants in terms of the calculation. You're aware of that? Yes. So I say that to tell you that I have not forgotten the, 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 the GAE <laughs> that workers. The that was a major decision that cost us um, a significant amount of money because you, you as an auxiliary worker, when you retire, you deserve a reasonable gratuity based on that. And so those gratuit those auxiliary workers, we had uh, a presentation to them, our ceremony at NEMA, where we, gave them, where we gave them their checks. There were people who received up to 20 something thousand dollars more because their amount under the previous Timothy Harris administration, they cut their amount by a third. So somebody who was supposed to get 30 something thousand under the, under the previous calculation only got like 10 something thousand. We then take the decision that they must get their extra 20 something thousand. And we look for them and we help them and we gave them their proper gratuity. Those who were affected with the 2021 decision of the Timothy Harris administration to downgrade the gratuity of the GAE workers. I say that to say that I have not forgotten. The other thing, so if you are to retire today, you will get your gratuity based on the new calculation that this new labor administration has put in place because and, and, we do care uh, about the GAE workers. I answered your questions. I wanted to, to just, if you, yeah, if you have something else, but I wanted to answer. And in based on... If I retire today, and it's going to make it my, my gratuity going based on my calculation, increase in, 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 in a minimum wage, please and fast before I retire. Thank you. Have a blessed day. All right, then. So... <laughs> So she's making a point, and I want, and I guess she understands where I'm coming from. So I want to thank her for calling in and being um, straightforward. But I've already made a significant step. So because of that, let's say she worked 30 years at what she's working for. She would have gotten, let's say, um, ten thousand dollars from if she if she had retired under the previous administration. But because she might retire, I don't know how old she is. You know, if she's at least. If she has at least you know 30 more years, I don't know how long she more she has to work. She retires under a sink its Nevis Labour Party's administration. She would get 30 th something thousand dollars, um, as opposed to 10 thousand dollars under the Timothy Harris administration. So I want the caller to know that. And secondly, caller, we have already so that is a major um, 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 decision that we made. So you already seen some benefits. You just haven't gotten it yet because you have not retired. The other matter is, um, caller, is with respect to the, the your your pension, the pension plan again that we call a number of meetings for. We have put the committee in place, and this is what you call the contributory pension, that it will be a savings. That is how it is actually set up right now. It is not based on how the social security is set up. It's separate and apart. The social security you will get. But the government pension plan is called a savings. So that savings will go to your pension, and you are guaranteed it. You are guaranteed, one, your gratuity, and you are guaranteed your pension as if every civil servant. But they will contribute. They can have the contri they will contribute to their savings. So let's say your, your, your contribution to it was at least 5000 It's not like Social Security, which has a different scheme where if you... Um, drop out at a certain point and you don't make enough contributions, you may not, you only go home with a small amount or none. Under this plan, you go home with what you save. So you cannot lose at all. And we are moving swiftly, caller, to put that in place. I know the government is in for just over a year. That is no excuse, but to show that we are serious about GAE workers. We have given you back your full gratuity, and we are moving swiftly ahead to put in place your contributory pension plan. So when you retire, you will get that pension plus your social security. 
And any company in St. Kitts and Nevis, I want to tell them to look at this model so that people can have um, a, a pension plan from your, com from your company and also one from Social Security. And I also I know there are some companies doing that, the contributory one, which helps significantly as well. So, Carla, I want to let you know that this government is moving swiftly on this, and we will make the announcement as the committee makes sure that everything is in place. There were too many significant things for workers left on the back burner. Increasing the minimum wage. How do you treat the pension plan for the gratuity workers? Um, Health care for the people of St. Kitts and Nevis. You know, education for the people of St. Kitts and Nevis. The things that really make a big difference in the lives of people, those things were neglected. Were neglected. And we are working hard to put them in place. All premise, of course, and the principles of good governance and helping us and building, sorry, towards a sustainable island state. So, Carlo, thank you for being open. You're from Division 6. That tells me that you're well politically in tune. <laughs> but we are working on your behalf, and we have done a significant thing for you already in terms of reinstituting the gratuity that was taken away from you by the former administration led by Timothy Harris. All right. So it's 13 after 3. We're going to take it. three more calls for your <laughs> prime minister, and then we wrap it up oh, for today. Call I, I have cabinet today. Oh, you have cabinet? <laughs> yes. Go ahead quickly with your, with your questions, caller. Don't quick me up. Even though we got me, me knows. <laughs> Don't quick me up, please. Greetings, I uh, extend in greetings to your honorable guests. Greetings, friends. Bless up. Greetings. Greetings. Okay. Um, the the the, 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 the control pour something to you concerning the present state of affairs with the economics, right? We're gonna step on top of that. And um, the thing is, you know, why right, that struggle there ongoing? The people who feel it most is the people within the low income bracket, you know? And um, we are always concerned about the masses, you see me? So, yes, uh, as we look forward, going forward, you, you, you put it, say, tourism going up, up, and, 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 um, and, and um, construction, uh, you put it there, and, um, and services. So, we're looking forward to a brighter thing. Well, we really are to, to see, sir, when, when the brighter things come, you know. Yeah, within the scheme of things, the situation with the masses get better. Yeah? Within the scheme of things. So, we just, we just want to say best wishes going forward. And we're looking forward to, I think it's nearest, that is open up. And... Open up in terms of the people, the, 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 the standard of living for the masses of the people, you know, be part of that open up. Yes, sir, love. Yeah? Yes, sir. Let, let, me, let, me, let me go to the caller. Caller, in his statement, a lot, of, a lot of things are embedded in that. He tells you that the caller is, is a deep man. He said a couple of things that I, I just can't let pass. He said, and he said it in simple language but the wisdom is deep. He said the people have to get the up and up. The IMF w said to us that what is hurting St. Kitts is the distribution of wealth, EK. Mm. It's the same thing the caller is saying. Why is it the masses not getting more of that wealth? The IMF said the same thing, mm. that too much of the wealth went to one direction and not in the other direction. And just giving passive money to the poor people is not going to resolve the issue. It's going to keep them poor. That is why you have to increase wages and give them opportunities to build wealth. Let me tell you a couple of things we're going to do. We are going to do something called an independence reset, EK. Mm. In Monday in Parliament, I'm asking the people to listen. We're going to reset. We're going to do an independence reset to give people a chance to reset. And then from there, go forward as the economy start to go again. So we're gonna say what that independence reset is. In addition to that, I want to announce and say today again that the shares at the cable, we are gonna divest them. And I have a plan, we have a plan as a team of how we are going to divest them. But this is gonna to add to the wealth portfolio of our people. We have to get wealth to the masses. If you don't get wealth to the masses, You'll have cycles of poverty repeating itself over and over, and we have to break it.
We have to break the cycle of poverty. But we have to be deliberate in delivering wealth to them. The way you deliver wealth is not just by the passive passing of money that does not deliver wealth, but to help them to participate in the growth that the country um, would, would, would experience. So I'm going to look for all the opportunities to help the people to grow well, because the narrower the difference between those who have and those who may not have as much is the better for the country. The wider the gap, that in itself is an impediment for development, a wide gap. You narrow the gap, that in itself propels development. With nothing else happening, that alone propels government. Just like if you get rid of uh, corruption as far as possible, that alone propels a government and the economy. So we are searching for ways how we can get wealth to those who are considered the masses of our people. And so we'll do the independence we set. We're going after the minimum wage. We're going after pension for the GAE workers. We're going after divesting shares and to make sure those shares also end up in the hands of the masses of the people so they can build wealth over time. Okay. All right, so caller. All right, we'll take these two final calls. All right, we missed that one. Let's take this one. Call your one, go ahead. I can take this last one, Ike. The last one, yeah. okay. You gotta, you gotta go, to cabinet. go to cabinet. Yeah. Call your one, go ahead. For parliament. Hello, you're on. Hello. Yes, go ahead with your question, Hello. please. Um, who, who is considered the masses for you, Mr. Prime Minister? Because the masses for us as poor people might be different for you. So I would really like to know. And I also realize that every time they keep saying, if under the former administration this wasn't done, this wasn't done, we are now aware, of course, we want to know what are you going to do because as far as we are concerned, nothing is being done. People are feeling a serious squeeze if we watch them when the pandemic was on. So you need to stop saying what this former administration didn't do and know what you are going to do and how long it's going to take because it's been a year now and nothing has been done. That's all I have to say for today. All right, EK, um Based on what the caller said, that nothing is being done, I want to list a number of things that have been done. And a number of things I know have impacted the caller as well. And so I will go through a number of things that have been done since the caller, um, you know, would, would have raised that particular uh, matter. So I will um, go through. Just give me one minute. Let me pull up the list because I want to be, sometimes I, I go over the list too quickly and don't point out all of the things um, that were done. Oh, give me a second. Mm. Right. Now, right. So with respect to speaking of the former administration, I want the caller to know that I had been accused of misleading the people, of you know, giving the people wrong information. And if you challenge me like that, I'm going to bring the facts. So I'm saying to the former, look, if you're going to challenge me like that, you have to know that the facts um, are coming. Okay, E.K., I would go through a number of things. One, we opened up the country, and as a result, the economy opened back up. The caller who was called, she has benefited from it. Because had the country continued with those restrictions, the economy, the growth of the economy would have been even slower. And we suffered because it stayed too long to open up. The caller benefited from that. I'm very, very sure. The other matter that we would have done is that when it came to the honorarium, I don't know where the caller works, we spent $5 million to make sure that those who were deprived of an honorarium, such as the nurses, the police officers, the security forces, and many others who work on the front line who were dissed and were not given the honorarium, while we had a minister in the person of Wendy Phipps taking home $27,000 and she was not working on the front line, that $5 million plus something dollars went to the people. We had the people at TDC. Uh, let me say that, uh, let me just say those who did not get their gratuity to be called, they did not take the vaccine. Um, and those people, we took on that completely as the government and make sure, made sure that they got the gratuity payment, people like Curtis Cook and so forth. Mm. I don't know who the call is. I don't know if she benefited from that, but at least the, the activity from that she benefited from. We went further, um, E.K., and we have employed in the government 
lots of people, not only that, but we have employed, even through the STEP program while the economy is recovering, over a thousand plus people. I don't know where the caller works again, so I don't know if she benefited from that. We also made sure that the GAE workers got their full gratuity. Some of them got 20000 more, $15,000 more. That went into the economy as well, and we know. We also paid two dividend payment. I'm sure that the caller might have gotten one of those. We paid double salary as well. I'm sure that the caller would have benefited either directly or indirectly as a matter of, uh, uh, as a measure. We then made college free for those parents who have to pay college. They don't have to pay. They benefited. And thousands of, of parents benefited. We made preschool. We increased the amount that preschool parents get for their children. So if the cost for preschool is $65, the parent used to honor the previous administration pay 25 plus, um, 25 plus 15. That is about what, EK? $40? No, right. Now, under this government, do you know how much they have to pay? Instead of paying $40, they now have to pay $15. Mm. Those parents are benefiting. Before school opened, we gave $250, and people are, I'm encouraging people to still access it if you have not, to those who are going back to preschool, I mean, to primary school and to high school. Got the college is free, and the preschool got their subvention. So all of them are costly. But I'm sure the caller either benefited directly or indirectly um, from that um, program and policy. Um, as well. The reduced interest yeah. on the yeah. student loans. The reduced interest on the student loans that benefited um, significantly. We had concessions and, and persons who had um, getting their children back to school. We had concessions. We created two fat days, so they had fat days, concessions, plus they had $250. Um, plus, as you say, the student loans, we took it from 9% to 5%, saving persons thousands of dollars suspended student loans payment during study so that families can send their children to college and save money um, significantly. We did that. We had refinancing at, at, um, at NHC so that people can reduce the payment and benefit from the NHC program. They benefited from, from, from that as well. So what we have done, EK, the water situation in Kayon that we, we are dealing with, the subsidy of electricity that we, we continue, you know, so we know that persons have benefited either directly or indirectly. So for someone to call and say the former administration and that nothing, they have to be understand. Not only that, we went ahead and we subsidized gasoline at the pump. EK for each gallon you buy, the government is paying two dollars and twenty-five cents. So you know, mm. presently, helping us to have one of the lowest gasoline price in the Caribbean. I, I'm not only saying the lowest because there's one other country I need to, to, to check out. But we have as much as uh, it's high because it's high from where we buy it from. I can't run away from that. But I'm saying that with each gallon of gas you put into your vehicle, we are paying $2.25 for your EK. Mm -hmm. That call I showed drives on a bus or she might have her own vehicle and she's benefiting from that as well. Because I know tomorrow if the gasoline price, if that is removed and go up, the busmen are going to say, look, today for sure. We're going to take up the bus prices, and she'll be affected. If she drives a car, she'll have to pay $2.25 more per gallon, and that would, of course, affect her pocket. So she's benefiting from that. We have also decided that we cut the VAT and f some food, VAT and freight, to temper the, the, the food prices. I know food prices have gone up, but we have done a lot to temper the price, and we'll do more. The caller, even the food prices, I want it to be lower. I know the caller has benefited from that because the caller eats. I'm very sure of that. So... And not only that, when the caller Don't goes to the, the subsidy on electricity. Yes, oh, EK. The <laughs> subsidy on electricity, I'm sure the caller has electricity. <laughs> we are spending $109 million a year to keep electricity costs one of the lowest again in the OECS and in the CARICOM region mm -hmm. because we are subsidizing it as $109 million. So the caller, again, is benefiting from that. So I want to say to people that I'm not going to act like there are not challenges. This is post-COVID time. We have wars, climate change, shocks, a lot of things happening. Open up the country too late, which, 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 is drag, which is a drag on us. And yet the government has stepped up to the plate to keep cost of living, one of the better cost of living within the OECS region and within the CARICOM. Do I want the cost of living to come down? Yes. Do I want the economy to go back, to grow even faster? Yes. And that is what we are working for. I will never defend, of course, getting more to the people. That, I think, is our job. But I just want people to also see the significant amount of work that the government has done in just a year. And those are some, just some of the measures that I've pointed out. When people reflect over time 
and they see what we would have done in a year, they would say, wow, that government really worked. But Don't hold are, your breath. Exactly. But we are not... As, uh, unless people are them. benefiting personally. But what I found, E.K., some, of, some people who are benefiting personally, they don't say they are benefiting personally. Mm. And that is fine. Uh, you know, so people... So at the end of the day, you might be right. But I think people are reasonable at the end of the day. And I think when they reflect, they would say, well, not all people, of course, <laughs> but they would say, look, I pay less for my child. I pay less for electricity. And I am paying less for this because the government is subsidizing this and creating this and so forth. And so I would say there are challenges, but this government is here to take on the challenge. I wanted us to talk a little bit about national security. I will delve into it another time. Yeah. We have taken some steps in national security. Is it a challenge? Yes, it is a challenge. And I wanted to go through some of the analysis from the peace program and for us to remember what the past ACP said that the program was used to um, f for people misuse the program and use it in a way to continue their activities and hardly any rehabilitation took place. We are now setting a path where that has to take place. So we are putting a number of measures in place. We have seen success in some areas. Because as you know, we had a real lull in, in debts from crime. We had one the other day. Then we had one which is not one at the gas station not connected to any gang-related activities or anything like that. But we had one just recently, and that, of course, people are concerned about. And so we have seen results from what has been implemented, and we we'll continue to work it, refine it, get it better. Because as a country, we, that is why before the elections, I never used crime as a political tool, a political ball, because this has to be dealt with from a national level. And all of us must be involved to solve this scourge. This has been affecting St. Kitts for too long, and we have not gotten effectively to the root of the problem. Putting a plaster on it is only creating a bigger sore, and that is what can be experienced if we don't deal with it. But I want to say to the people that we are dealing with it. Um, we have seen results from what has been done, and of course we want to save our people's lives. But apart from saving our young men's lives, we want our young men to do positive things. EK, there are too, much, too many positive things. I see young men into the orange economy, people singing here, singing there, playing football here, basketball here, lots of activities. We launched that economy to give people alternatives um, to things. And then we, st we started the Elevate program, and they are not without some sort, some income. That is the other part of it that people are asking. If you are getting support, why are you still want to engage in this type of activity? That is the question that we must ask. So ask our people to ask our people to act right, to do right. Because think it's a Nevis must once and for all deal with this problem. So I want to say that we are taking it on, we are dealing with it head on, and we want to give our young people as much opportunities to pursue the dream so they have alternatives to turn away from any lifestyle of crime and violence which is not serving any of us properly. But I want to thank the security forces because they have been working tirelessly hard. And if we are objective and we look at their results, we will see that they have seen results. And we are putting in place a sustainable plan, a workable plan, a non-corrupt plan. We call it corrupt plans lead to worse um, situations which can get to the point of no return if we cross that line that other countries in the Caribbean have crossed. They have crossed the line, and I'm trying to pull us back from not crossing a certain line. Because if you cross that line, no matter what comes after that, that will take decades of a concerted effort to totally resolve. So, E.K., I continue to say to our people that we'll work hard on the premise of good governance, seeking to establish a sustainable island state where our people can have the best life possible. Is it challenging? Yes. But are we up to it? Yes, we are. And I want to, on that point, say hope is there and the government is working hard on your behalf. I want to thank the people of St. Kitts and Nevis very much for joining us this afternoon, E.K. And of thank course, you. thank you so much, Prime Minister, for always coming. <laughs> you know, I mean, somebody was mentioning here that this is the first time in history that we have a Prime Minister who we nearly fed up a scene because every time he pops up here for a press conference, pops up there for a little chat, pops up there. So yeah. um, yes. it's good that you just pop in from time to time. And engage with the people. Yes, thank indeed. You. So always thank you so much for your time, Pierre, and all the best. All right, so folks, uh, that's going to do it for us here on Issues this afternoon.
And uh, as always, we thank you, the callers, the listeners, the viewers, for your contributions, for your participation in this program. Enjoy the rest of your day. We'll see you on the flip side for Island Rhythms. shouldn't be a hassle. It can be as easy as a single call to Amerijet International, your worldwide cargo transportation solution. We provide all the services you need to ship your goods anywhere in the world. Whether your shipment is fresh, frozen, large or small, alive or hazardous, you can count on Amerijet to deliver it safe and sound. Amerijet International, by land, sea or air, we get it there. For more information, visit us online at www.amerijet.com or call us at KDP Enterprises at 466-9595. If you live here in St. Kitts and your town called Ilya, there's only one place that you should be. They'll be driving in the evening and you need some fuel. Go straight to Delta, don't be a fool. Get your fucking gas. Go Delta, gas. Go Delta, go Delta, go Delta, go Delta. All petroleum needs, ULSD. Go Delta, go Delta, go Delta. Everyone in the region is shouting, Go Delta! Premium gasoline and a fully stocked sea store. So there's only one place it should be. Delta Petroleum, baby! Managing money can be tough, so choose the St. Kitts Credit Union to save and borrow responsibly. As we continue to keep your best interests at heart, the St. Kitts Credit Union is diverse enough to provide exceptional service, low fees, great interest rates, a user-friendly mobile app, prepaid debit cards, and much more. The St. Kitts Credit Union, the best place to borrow, the best place to save. RIA Easy Money Transfer Limited, located on West Independence Square Street, Bastyr St. Kitts, and the Solomon Arcade Nevis, offers you safe and reliable transfers at great low rates and fees to 507,000 locations worldwide, with a pickup time of just 15 minutes after your transfer. And for even more ease of doing business, we home deliver and direct bank deposits in selected countries. So if anytime you want to send money to family, friends, and loved ones, at RIA, we've got you covered. With over 30 years of experience moving money quickly, efficiently, and securely across 